I shut my face. <laughs> Perfect timing. So Father's Day is a holiday honoring, honoring one's father, as well as fatherhood, paternal bonds, the influence of fathers in society. And I found some interesting trivia. The United, in the United States, Father's Day was founded in the state of Washington by a young woman, Sonora Smart Dodd, in 1910. She attended a Mother's Day service at her church, and she had been she and her five siblings had been raised by a single dad. And she said, "Well, it's great to have a Mother's Day, but we didn't have a mother. We had a father. Let's have a Father's Day service." Today, I've asked John and Kai to join me in sharing a few thoughts about Father's Day. By way of introduction, first, let me talk about two iconic fathers: one good and one bad. Tevya the Dairyman was a fictional character, I was surprised to learn, uh, written by Sholem Aleichem in the 1800s. And we know Fiddler on the Roof, many of us know Fiddler on the Roof, and that portrayal of fatherhood, and he did everything he could for his daughters. So that's on one hand. On the other hand, Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> so George Lucas had uh, his first movie project was a science fiction movie, and he loved science fiction movies. Uh, there was no, in the 19, late 1960s, there was no appetite in the United States for a new science fiction movie, so he directed a little film uh, over just a week or so called American Graffiti, and that cost only a million dollars to make, and it started making millions of dollars in the theaters. And with that, he was able to write a draft of his uh, a Flash Gordon update. He actually wanted to shoot Flash Gordon. He couldn't get the rights to it, so he had to write his own movie uh, called Star Wars, which he wrote. The theaters thought, nobody's gonna watch a movie about space. So they gave him a tiny budget and sent him to a little theater, a little recording studio in England. So that's why so many of the actors are British, is because it was filmed in this inside a studio in near London. And Darth Vader, you know, he's a hard-working dad. We all appreciate the hard-working dad. And uh, I think he ends up cutting the hand off his son. And I'm sure he's gonna apologize for that, like my dad would have. But I think between Tevye the Dairyman and Darth Vader, that sort of sets the limits of what we're talking about today for Father's Day. Uh, so I've asked John to give us five minutes, and then Kai to give us five minutes, and then I'll wrap up. Or did I say the other, other way? Who's ready? John, you're closest. I once used this beginning in a talk I gave to adoptive parents, adoptees, and birth parents. In the beginning, there was frolicking, and it was good. <laughs> but it can turn out that it's not always easy to conceive children, much less raise them. In addition to the monthly punishment of failed attempts when one has some difficulty, medicine brings a host of tools and investigations. Handing in your sperm sample is a humbling experience, for example, but nothing like what my partner was experiencing. The point is that there are different ways to become a parent, and, or in my case, um, a father. We took the adoption off-ramp from medical procedures. For some, local adoption and the chance that a young parent will turn you down is, is a bit much, and so international adoption became popular over the years. My father-in-law in the UK had a head nurse from Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, who knew a woman who knew a woman who had placed a, a child in an orphanage there. When the time came, we traveled to approximately the other side of the world. When they walked down the middle with bug spray, we kind of thought, well, that's interesting. We landed and found that the sergeant of the police inspector who was married to the contact person was doing the Jedi mind tricks to get us through the airport quickly. That didn't work on luggage, but other than that, we arrived at their home, and there was an 11-month-year-old boy sitting on somebody's lap. And they said, here's your son. 
Attachment might have been a bit more complicated than that, but you had to admire their enthusiasm. We raised Evan, and attachment grew. I remember heading into the world with a child who was clearly adopted and wondering, what are people thinking? I was spoiling for a fight. They just would push him on the swings, though, and you can't really shout at them for that. Um, it takes time for both the parents and the child to have a child, be in relationship with a child. So biological children, should we try one more time? By this time, it had been eight years of trying. I really wanted the money back from those early years with the condoms and everything, but anyway. So the internet said, um, use birth control, stop, and then do that thing. So why not? Let's try that. So Evan is about five, and I'm tying his shoes to go out for Halloween. And a positive pregnancy test slides across my field of view. <laughs> the rest of the night was a bit of a haze, uh, and the world has never been quite the same. So we had lots of procedures in creating this family, but they produced actual humans who would interact with each other too. I think Evan had trouble in the early years with the fact that June did not leave. <laughs> it was a nice visit and all, but you could go. For example, he, he kept a box of the heads of June's Lego people. No threat there. So Evan and June was, and to a degree are, riding versus dancing and acting. Cars and welding versus software engineering. Many, many partners versus one who June is now married to. When I mix up their names, Evan likes to point out that they are color-coded, so... <laughs> At present, Evan works hard to take care of his separated parents and regularly checks in, which we might not have expected years and years ago. He's a remarkable human who knows many things. Both the boys do, and they are good friends to their friends. Their relationship with each other? Well, I have different relationships with them as a father. With Evan, I learned how to tack a horse and write a check, and watch horses go in circles for hours. The riding parents would just sort of huddle next to each other for warmth, and go frighteningly fast in shows. He now asks if I'm going to be at home at a decent time for when he makes dinner. Last night, a friend asked Evan about any particular memories he had of me as a father. It's kind of a clever idea. I wish I'd thought of it. Carrying him on my shoulder in airports and the hilarity that ensues when you don't watch for things above you is a favorite. <laughs> he also said last night that he liked underducks. So you got your 33-year-old welder telling you he really liked underducks. And situations where I would make one pratfall or another I think he likes safety and love from me, and I'm kind of happy to provide that. With Juan, I watch dancers go in circles for hours and perform in shows. When Juan regales me in some detail about his work, I am very grateful that computers generally do what they do without me fully understanding why. The therapist I work with says, she works on her meditation during periods like this with her sons. But my job as a father is clear. I listen intently. I am there. I am completely present. At one point, I was inspired to film June once a week for several years, talking about life. I have not taken the opportunity to look at those videos, and I really must. Whatever the record that resulted, it afforded the chance to talk about many things with him. A central value in my model of fatherhood. Now that I'm living with Evan, it's repeating there too. He'll sit down in the chair and it's, it's time. These boys are remarkable. I'm very proud of them. They will do fine. everybody. I did not write anything down because I want to speak from the heart. And John, thank you. That was lovely. I'd love to hear about your presence being 
com so completely present for your children. And what I really want to talk about is the absences. Um, I have a lot of pain around fathers, and I don't know if it's connected with me as my particular perspective on our gender system. I just consider it that we live in a very toxic one, and its impact on people is, I mean, I see, I see the negative, so maybe that's my perspective, but my experience of fathers has been loaded with pain. Um, I'm thinking of my own father, and the, the few times in my life that, that there was light, so I'm trying to find the, the light in, in this. Um, when I was between about 10 and 16, we did have a closeness through physical activity, um, backpacking, climbing. He taught me to lead as a rock climber. Um, and then not long after that, it was clear to me that he was jealous of my growing stronger than him. And, and um, he kind of fell off my hero's worship platform and never really returned. And I found that you know my mother was always dominating the conversations that were mainly long distance. And I never really felt connected to him most of my life. Um, and then two years ago, he had a stroke that somehow collapsed that wall, that wall of distance, and loosened his tongue and his emotions. Um, and I was, I was in Nashville, Tennessee, helping him, visiting him in the care home. He had permission to come home for one visit for one day. And I remember his latest graduate student was there visiting with his wife from, from Ukraine. And this student, Bogdan, was, it was amazing to me to watch them because it was like he was in love with my dad. It was some sort of a love relationship. He was dismissing his wife and sort of just fawning. He was so attached to my dad. And he was telling me all about how wonderful my dad was because he was so social and everywhere he went, he loved people. And this is like, I never knew this person. I didn't know him at all. I thought he was somebody as a mathematician who couldn't talk to people. So again, I don't know that if that was my fault or the family situation, that he developed patterns in the family of, of letting my mother dominate and receding in the background, but it was, it's um, very painful to realize that for most of his life, I didn't know him. Um, I'm thinking of the man who could have been my father-in-law, but um, who happened to be my father's PhD thesis advisor, so it was kind of an incestuous family situation. <laughs> Um, in Boulder, Colorado, the University of Colorado, uh, Don Monk. And um, he was also, as a mathematician, very closed to himself, but the, the family had a kind of habit of just being together, but not really talking about anything that I thought was meaningful. And um, when we were trying to have children, you know, he, he listed all the things that I was doing and it was dismissively kind of implying that we wouldn't be able to take care of children. And I felt very hurt by it. And so I tried to talk with him about that. And he just turned away from me on a hike like when I tried to talk. And so there's just this sense that you weren't allowed to talk about anything. Um, and after my mother-in-law, who really was present, like when my, our children were born, she came every day and helped out. She was, even though it was hard to get up the stairs, she arrived every day at 10 a.m. And I was a stay-at-home parent. And, but my this man who could have been my father-in-law, like he didn't even talk to the children. He wouldn't even um, sit down with them or address them or engage with them. And he just seemed to think that just sitting in a chair in the corner was his way of being a father. Um, after my mother-in-law's death, he decided he needed to have his caregiver, who was 50 years younger than him, as his girlfriend. And we had a falling out. I was just, I 